Um, we've been running some workshops for this year's our 10th year. And Fernando has helped in two or three. And other well-known names in mechanical ventilation have been really helpful. And I have come to understand that the best way to learn something is to try to teach it. Because when you try to teach it, you actually have to understand it much better. And for us, it's been really a privilege to have people um, of, of so many places. Many would recognize a good friend. He's Nelson Claude from Eduardo Bancalari's unit. Manuel Sanchez Luna from Europe. He runs one of the largest uh, NICUs in Europe, in Spain. Istvan Seri um, and Gianluca Lista from Milan. So they're being all, we run a workshop that's for 25 people. And basically, we have um, a person that comes from abroad, an expert, apart from our group. So it's a very intimate three-day and very intensive workshop with animal models. We use a piglet model. Um, we use um, pneumatic simulators. Uh, we have a lot of involvement of the because it's a very small group, such as this one. Uh, and we have a small setup with, uh, that's been you know, uh, sponsored by Dreger, in which we have two VN500s, and we have all the necessary equipment. It's like a small NICU to prepare the, the, the setup. So what I'm going to show you today is basically what we usually start with in the workshop, which is the summary of um, respiratory physiology applied to mechanical ventilation without going into many details, but trying to focus on practical aspects of um, neonatal physiology. Excuse me if I go through some very basic things, but I usually believe that once you understand the basics truly, the, what's more interesting is to actually apply that on the bedside. And um, you get to see a lot of correlation there. So we're usually involved with a very difficult transition from fetal to neonatal, neonatal life. And that requires a huge amount of changes in what um, involves the lung. And one of the first things is that we have pulmonary fluid clearance. And I think we're beginning to understand more and more, and some interventions have been proposed to actually facilitate this transition. I'm not going to go into that, such as sustained lung inflation probably, but um, basically to understand that the fetus has to remove all that amount of fluid, and that requires several mechanisms that have been proposed, adrenaline, steroids, the transpulmonary gradient, the fetal position, the mechanism of labor. And more and more, we're understanding that the effort that the baby does plays a leading role in this transitional elimination of or fluid clearance from the lung. So that has led to believe that it is not the same to confront a baby that has no effort than a baby that actually is breathing and we just have to support that baby. So it could be that in the future we have different guidelines for those two types of baby. And it makes sense to think that if we don't have some respiratory effort, we might be in a situation where we have to apply or help that baby in a different manner. So um, there's a beautiful review of Hooper in Neo Reviews. And this is a very nice graph in which you see the, how the baby is first, <coughs> the compliance, and how it evolves over the first few minutes and then hours of life. Then you can see the function, functional residual capacity here, how it gains incredible incredibly steep, the gain of functional residual capacity, and the resistance of the airway goes dramatically down very quickly over the first few minutes. And so 
the contributing factors to this pulmonary fluid clearance are mechanical forces during labor. Then there was, a few years ago, a lot of emphasis was put into epithelial sodium channel activation by adrenaline and vasopressin. The aquaporins and their expression are important. But now a lot, has, a lot of research has gone into understanding the role of negative pressure during inspiration, the, the effort that the baby is doing to actually clear that fluid, and also the po positive pressure during crying. So the rate of elimination is huge. It's almost 3 mLs per kilo per second. The clearance is very fast if everything goes well. And in Journal of Applied Physiology, there's this very uh, illustrative graph where you can see how the baby is, with each breath, gaining and increasing the baseline and gaining functional residual capacity. So we can see that only in a few breaths the baby is acquiring this functional residual capacity and basically what we have to do is try to help, thank you, we have to try to help the baby not lose that. So I think a huge change has happened over the past few years where we're using more and more CPAP in the delivery room. Can I ask you a question? Yes. With the fetal lung fluid, um, is there any physiologic benefit to making sure that the baby absorbs as much of that as possible or are we just looking to clear it? Like I know the negative pressure will absorb it, but there are times in the delivery room where the baby I don't think we have much of a choice there because the best you can do would be to actually suction the upper airways. That's as, 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 as far as you can go because most of the, um, this pressure makes the fluid go into the interstitial space and then starts being cleared through the circulation in a more slow fashion. And that's why some people have... Um, proposed interventions in which you apply much greater pressure up to 20 or 25 centimeters of water. And there's a publication in pediatrics early this year by Lista where you actually do a sustained inflation to actually gain and make this much quicker. And there are obviously not, it's not an accepted um, intervention, although in Europe they're introducing it in asphyxiated babies in their resuscitation guidelines, not in spontaneously breathing babies, because those don't have this effort to actually do it on their own. So it's interesting. I think um, a few changes can, can, can occur over the next few years in that aspect. And you can see this with face contrast technique, how just with one breath, the baby is gaining a huge amount of functional residual capacity and you can see it very graphically. And this is a fetus. This is an animal model. Three breaths <coughs> and five breaths and you can see how much air content. You can see it more, much more white and clear. So basically what we're talking about here is we're trying to protect this FRC and the natural equilibrium between the tendency or the natural tendency in the premature infant to collapse the lung and to sustain the rib cage arrives into an equilibrium at a point where the net volume inside the lung it's not so high. And sometimes it's below the critical closure of these alveoli. So what we do is we try to set that equilibrium at a different point, trying to increase with some peep, 
the pressure inside the lung so that we can shift this you know, point into a place where we have some residual capacity here. And some babies only need that. So um, I'm not so sure what you're doing here, but most places I've been to and what we're doing is most babies arrive to the NICU only with CPAP and we're electively intubating them when they need that over the first two to six hours and not immediately in the delivery room. At least that's what we're doing more and more every day. Intubations in the delivery room have gone down significantly, at least in our center, basically with the use of CPAP or PEEP. So, sorry, this was in Spanish. <laughs> Um, that's with peep, without peep. <laughs> I missed that one. <laughs> but, uh, so basically we can see that if the baby is the lung gas volume, we can see that with peep, we maintain a functional residual capacity without the efforts don't um, allow the accumulation of this volume within the lung. So because the equilibrium is set much lower and the lung remains much more closed. And this has been shown to be very uh, not healthy for the baby. We know that only six insufflations can damage significantly the lung. Even spontaneous uh, respirations that actually go from atelectasis to an open lung can do a lot of damage. So. Um, Going to some practical aspects, and we were talking about that, we um, studied uh, in a pneumatic model that had a system for sim simulating breathing, and we could measure pressure here, which would be the equivalent to intrapleural pressure. We could measure pressure here, which would be the equivalent of distal airway pressure, because that pressure would be the same as this. We were testing different nasal prongs with and without leak. We had a flow sensor here. So when we had leak, the flow sensor would quantify the amount of leak, because normally in a closed system, the flow here would be zero. If we opened the system and created a leak, any flow through here would quantify exactly how much leak we had. And we also placed a flow sensor in the inspiratory limb of the ventilator. We tested this with several ventilators and several um, um, prongs. And what we found was, and this is responding to your question the other day, we tested two equivalents. One, a high resistance system. I don't know if you know the RAM cannula, which is very similar to um, a nasal, it's like um, the uh, high flow nasal cannula. So, and we had the argyle, which is the one we saw here which is a low resistance system. And we use that one just because it has an easy connection to an ET tube, much similar. So it would be more difficult to use <coughs> the Hudson or any or the Inca prongs or any other one. But basically what this tries to show is once you have a closed, a completely closed system, you will have the exact same pressure in the circuit and in the baby. The moment you create a leak, that changes completely. Why? Because you have, if the amount of pressure that you will have in the system will not necessarily transmit to the baby. And this is what we are testing here in the model. We are measuring the flow. So we have the circuit pressure, which is very similar to what we are setting for 
millibar, <laughs> almost an equivalent to centimeters of water. 3.4, very similar. And this was using a fixed flow ventilator, the Baby Log 8000. But when we were using the Argyle, look how much we were losing in pressure when we measured the distal pressure, which would be the equivalent to wh of what was arriving to the proximal airway of the baby. We're losing almost two centimeters of water, so the pressure drop was 55% with a leak of 42%. We weren't able to control the leak because the leak, independent of how much you opened the leak, was depending on the play of different pressures there. If we went up to 6 millibars, we arrived to a pressure here of 7.4 in the circuit. The distal pressure came down to 4.1, so we had a 44.6 drop in pressure. Again, with 8, we had almost a 50% of drop in pressure from 8 to 4. So this would be what would be actually getting the baby if the circuit was open. And by definition, in a nasal CPAP, it's usually open. The interesting thing is when we go to test a high resistance cannula, such as the RAM cannula, and probably this is applicable to any other high resistance system, we see that the pressure drop is huge. 75%, 73%, and 68%. So the amount of pressure that that baby is actually receiving is really small. And one wonders, OK, so many of the times we know that even if we extubate babies into um, head box, not all of them, as we saw yesterday, actually fail. Almost there's a failure rate of 36% or 42%, sorry, in the meta-analysis. So there's almost 60% of them that actually do well. So I wonder, and what we're actually giving is very tiny amounts of pressure. So when one says, okay, let's put this baby on nasal CPAP with a certain, a certain, um, amount of pressure, I'm very concerned of what type of prongs we're using because that will relate directly on how much true pressure is getting to the baby. I'm going to present this data hopefully late, later this year in the ESPR meeting in Budapest. So going to more um, invasive um, <coughs> mechanical ventilation, ventilation physiology, we know a basic principle. A gas moves from a zone of high pressure to a zone of lower pressure. That's by definition. Otherwise, we don't have any gas movement. And during inspiration, the alveolar pressure should be lower than atmospheric pressure, determining a pressure gradient. And therefore, during expiration, this gradient must be inverted for the air to come out. And that's very basic. So we know that during spontaneous ventilation, we have a pressure gradient created basically by the diaphragm. Why? Because we lower the alveolar pressure and we create that gradient between atmospheric and alveolar pressure. So we create a sub-atmospheric um, pressure in the alveoli. And air goes in until it equilibrates the pressures again. So if we graph this, we will see that if we create this gradient of pressure, we will have an inspiratory flow that will be dependent on the quantity of this gradient, and we have a resulting <coughs> volume going into the baby. In spontaneous ventilation, normally 
if we have a model and try to see the, the more dynamic repercussion of what we're doing, of what's happening there, and we have three compartments, the pleural pressure compartment, the intra-abdominal compartment, and the periphery, which will be basically influenced by atmospheric pressure, we will have, and we know that the venous return depends from the difference between the systemic circulation and the right heart, the right atrium, to be exact. So if we lower the pressure here, we increase the pressure because of the contraction of the diaphragm, and we will create a bigger gradient and improve venous return. That's in a spontaneously breathing baby. <coughs> When we have a baby on assisted ventilation, what happens is we invert the way that we are creating that gradient because if, let's assume that the baby doesn't have any spontaneous breathing and forget about this, we will have an increased above atmospheric pressure, pressure gradient creating this difference with the alveoli, and then we will have what we see normally in our mechanical ventilation graphics. We will see a pressure gradient, an inspiratory flow, an expiratory flow as soon as the valve of the, the expiratory valve opens, and a resulting volume, which no ventilator actually measures, but calculates by integrating the area below the flow curb. So things are not always one or the other. We usually play with the effort of the baby, and we have both things interacting simultaneously. So we have a differential pressure that's created by the machine, but we also have a differential pressure that's created by the effort of the baby, and it makes a lot of sense to synchronize both and not have them compete. So although there's no direct evidence that synchrony actually improves any outcome, it makes a lot of sense to have them work together. And this is interesting because then you will have a resulting transpulmonary pressure. <coughs> and we can see the effect and the amount of how much effort the baby is doing when we sedate or paralyze a baby. We're doing that less and less. I don't think we sedate any premature babies unless they're in a very particular situation. But then when we eliminate this spontaneous breathing, we will see that the resulting volume that's entering the lung of the baby will come down immediately because although the ventilator is not able to measure how much effort the baby is doing, it will measure the amount of air or gas that's going into the lungs. So this is the animal <coughs> model that we have in our, in our lab. And we connected a flow sensor. We put an esophageal catheter that was connected for detecting the esophageal pressure and therefore something similar to the alveolar pressure and we were connecting this to the output of the ventilator, the proximal pressure created by the ventilator. So when the little piglet is spontaneously breathing you see a flow of air going in and out. You see the efforts of this piglet and you have, in an inspiratory time, the pressure gradient that is created by the piglet translates into an inspiratory flow, then an expiratory flow. But when we sum both things up, we have the inspiratory, I mean the um, pressure gradient created by the piglet plus the pressure gradient created by the ventilator, and we have a much greater inspiratory 
flow. And therefore, if we integrated this area, the actual volume entering the lung would be much greater. So what happens when we have a baby on mechanical ventilation with the hemodynamics? We have some pressure put into the system. So our alveolar or our intrathoracic pressure goes up. The intra-abdominal pressure also goes up because the diaphragm <coughs> is pushed down. And therefore, our gradient for venous return goes down. That, on conventional ventilation, may not have such a high impact. Why? Because we are having high pressures on an intermittent basis. But when we actually put this baby on a constant high pressure, such as we do when we connect a baby on high frequency, what will happen is that we will have a very significant impact on hemodynamics. I understand that you don't do those um, echoes here. I mean, the attendings don't use the echocardiograph here. <coughs> uh, we have that opportunity there. We're just trained on the basics. So we're able to see the inferior cava. And we're able to tell, before we connect a baby to high frequency, if the baby has a preload that's very low, a collapsed venous return, and therefore detect which babies may need a volume load before being connected to high frequency. And that's very helpful. And we had a baby recently where we connected the baby to high frequency. And the right ventricle just, we were looking at it, just collapsed. And that baby only needed a little bit more volume. And then we were able to maintain <coughs> the same pressures. So it's very graphic when you're able to actually see what you're doing instead of just kind of guess. Um, so obviously, we are creating a differential pressure. And the gas will flow according to this differential pressure and the magnitude of it until it reaches an equilibrium. But that takes time. And the concept of time constant, which used to be so theoretical, now we can see it in the ventilators. We can actually measure it. And the concept, the, the, the concept is very simple. Basically, <laughs> it's the measure of the necessary time for the lung to inflate or deflate. So going back to our scheme, the time necessary for alveolar and proximal pressure to equilibrate. Once we create a differential pressure, the equilibrium doesn't get there instantly. It takes time. The more compliant the lung is, it takes more time. The less <coughs> compliant, the more rigid, the more sick that baby's lung is, it will take less time. And before we used to put uh, inspiratory time, just a little bit of guesswork, I think now we can actually see what we're doing and what the baby needs and actually start ad adapting. And at least what we always uh, teach in our group is that we can now make you know, a tailored ventilation for that baby instead of having a constant you know, amount of inspiratory time depending on the disease that we think the baby has. So um, probably everybody's familiarized with the pulmonary graphics. And we see them all the time in the, in the <coughs> mechanical ventilators. Um, unfortunately, us physicians, at least in, in Chile, we don't spend that much time right next to the ventilators. So at least in my view, probably it's the nurses who spend the most time right next to the baby and right next to the ventilator. 
And I think if anybody should know more about pulmonary graphics, it should be the nurses because they're the ones who are going to tell us <laughs> if something is not going right or if something has changed from the last time that we adjusted that ventilator. So let's just see what do you think about these four graphics and which one do you think is the best? Does anybody vote <coughs> for graph A? Nobody. Okay. Graph B? Okay. Graph C? Some people don't like any of them. Okay. <laughs> And anybody likes graph D? You're saying this looks very similar to that one? OK. So let look, let's look at them uh, with, with a different perspective. Because most of the time, this is graph A amplified. So most of the time, we don't have the opportunity to see, we are only seeing what's happening with the pressure in the circuit. We're not seeing actually what's happening with the pressure <coughs> distally in the baby. But that, let's simulate that. So in this graph, what we're having is we're having this rise in pressure that follows the amount of pressure that we are actually administering. And we reach a point where we already got to the maximum pressure and we have an extra time there, which will only serve the purpose of maintaining the lung insufflated. So if we want that, because we need more mean airway pressure, because we need to oxygenate the baby more, that's fine. But if we think that we're only requiring the amount of volume, this has zero flow. Because once we created the differential pressure, the equilibrium has already been reached, and no flow will go past this point. Then the aspiratory valve is opened and passively this lung will deflate and we have the aspiratory flow which will eventually reach zero flow because it has reached again an equilibrium. So here we could say we have an excessively long inspiratory time. On graph B, sorry. Not necessarily volume trauma, because this doesn't mean that you will have more volume going into the lung, because the integrated amount, the integration of this curve will be the same. Even if you shift this here, the amount of volume will be the same. You will just insufflate it and keep it there, which is not something that, if you remember the piglet, we don't do that. We don't have an inspiratory pause. We do it, and babies usually do it very fluently, go from inspiration to aspiration. Okay? So in graph B, we can simulate again. So. We get to a point where the equilibrium is reached, <coughs> and that's exactly that point. We're giving enough time for the lung to insufflate, and then we're opening the aspiratory valve and giving enough time for the lung to deflate. So this seems to be a very good choice. If we go to curve C, we have 
the same as before. The problem is, in the aspiration, we're not giving enough time for the lung to deflate. And therefore, some pressure is left in the lung. And the next inspiration comes. And we start acquiring a residual pressure within the lung, which is called inadvertent PEEP. And the problem with this is that we won't see this in the ventilator, because the ventilator, usually the graphs compensate. And we don't see this going up, but it tends to regulate it. And this will be definitely a short aspiratory time. The last one is we think we're giving this delta pressure, but in fact, we're only giving this. So no matter if we're dialing 15 or 18 of maximum pressure, we're actually only giving time to use part of that pressure. Why? Because the time that we're allocating to the inspiration is not enough. So we're clearly seeing that we have a short inspiratory time, and we can see this very characteristic amputation of inspiration. So we see this <coughs> very clearly in which we try to um, go. This should have more time to go to flow zero, and then we have the amputation of inspiration. So um, we can regulate this, for example, in pressure support, where we can get to a point where we have some um, ventilators like the Draeger brand. They don't allow you to play with this percentage. They fix it at 15%, where you have 15% of the maximum flow velocity and it will open automatically the aspiratory valve. So you're synchronizing not only the inspiration with the flow sensor, but also synchronizing the aspiration because you lose control over the inspiratory time. The inspiratory time gets adjusted automatically. Why? Because once the flow goes down and reaches a certain point, a threshold, it opens the aspiratory valve. So you give more autonomy to the ventilator, and that's pressure support by definition. Um, some other ventilators, such as the Care Fusion brand, they allow you to play with this termination uh, percentage <coughs> in which you can play from 5% to 25%. Um, when I get the opportunity to play with it, I really set it up in 10 to 15% because I don't see any, any benefit of increasing it above that. I don't know if you have any issues or any comments on that. Any pressure support? Mm -hmm. large, large leaks around the EPC. So, I, uh, for instance, I, I had an neonatologist ask me, why is my mean airway pressure higher in pressure support mode than it was in conventional ventilation? And I went and I looked at the graphics and you could clearly see on the flow trait that what was happening was uh, because of the leak around the EP tube, the ventilator just kept blowing air until the next breath started, was initiated. And so what you saw in the tracing was a flow coming down about halfway on expiration and then just, uh, or, or on inspiration, and then just continuing until the next breath started because it could never get to the 15% of peak flow okay. because of the leak, so it just kept blowing. And so in cases of big air leaks, you can, you can turn that up to, I've had it on 40, 50, yeah, the issue is that any, when, when you have a very high leak, anything that is dependent on the flow sensor <laughs> is very risky to use sometimes because yeah, cause you might... You know, mm. Yeah, I know at, at Foresight, for instance, if they have more than a 40% leak, they automatically reinstate. What we do is we generally turn off any mode that is depending on reading 
the flows of the baby if we have more than 30%. For example, volu using volume guarantee with more than 30% leak is tricky. Basically because probably the reading that you're getting from the ventilator of the amount of volume that's going in, even with a ventilator that compensates in both ways with pressure and flow such as the VN500, I'm not so sure I would be comfortable with more than a 30% leak. So, um, we know that the pulmonary, we already talked about this, the pulmonary mechanics, and we know that the airway resistance, although we do have a smaller airway as we branch down to the finer and more distal airways, the net cross area and the total cross section is much, much bigger as you go down because although they're smaller, they're more and more. So actually the highest resistance is in the proximal airway. And we usually elongate it even more with our ET tubes. And another concept is that, and I think this is very interesting because um, compliance is something that is now not theoretical anymore because we get a reading in a ventilator. So we're getting a reading of compliance in a ventilator and many centers are, at least many neonatologists in our group are starting to use that as a sign of improvement after surfactant, for example. But a word of caution, compliance as you all know, is the measure of the variation of the pulmonary volume resulting from the variation of pressure in the lung. It means, okay, how much volume you're going to get for every unit of pressure that you apply to that lung. And obviously, you will have a static compliance, which in neonatology we never have, in which you would have to measure compliance with zero flow and some adult ventilators, such as the Evita, can you know, actually make the graph with zero flow with a patient and show us the volume, the pressure volume curve with a static compliance, which is a much more reliable compliance. What we do have is at least what these ventilators claim they give us is dynamic compliance, which is the average compliance of the curve, that the, of the pressure volume curve that the uh, ventilator has. The problem with that is that what they're telling us is not the true compliance. And why? Because, and we can, we can see that in the ventilator, because to measure compliance, the ventilator can only use two variables. The volume that the ventilator is calculating that's going into the lung and that is integrated through the flow sensor and if even if there's some leak it will deduct what's coming out from what's coming in and therefore have a relatively good estimation of the volume that's going into the baby. The problem comes in this part because the ventilator can only know how much pressure the ventilator is actually giving, but it cannot estimate how much pressure the baby with its own effort is contributing. So the transpulmonary pressure will be more than the actual pressure the ventilator is giving. So it generally overestimates the compliance. An example. Let's have a sedated baby with no respiratory effort. Probably that's the only case in which the compliance measured by the ventilator will be the true dynamic compliance. Let's start having the, this baby improve its ventilatory or respiratory effort. What will happen is that it will add to whatever delta pressure the ventilator is giving an additional pressure differential. So the result 
will be more volume being um, pumped into that lung. And the way that the ventilator calculates this, it will say, OK, now I have more volume, and I'm getting the same pressure, and the compliance will improve. But what has actually improved is not the compliance, but the effort of the baby. So one has to take this into account when only seeing and interpreting the number compliance in the mechanical ventilator. Because that, unless you have an esophageal balloon, which we don't use regularly in neonates in the NICU, you will always have an overestimation of compliance and vary a lot of variation from one moment to the other. So we know this, and this looks very nice. And it's absolutely theoretical, as you all know. The ideal is to ventilate here, avoid over distension, and avoid under distension. And that sounds very easy, but we all know it's very, very hard. And why? Because generally, the lung is completely asymmetrical. So we might have some alveoli that are here, others that are here, and some that are here. So what we're seeing in the pressure volume curve is the average of the whole lung. But what we have to try is that at least the less amount of alveoli fall below the critical pressure of closure. Because otherwise, we will have some alveoli that will be closing and opening on every inspiration. And that's a great way to create inflammatory mediators and to promote lung damage. And that's not easy to know, because what we know currently is how much lung we're, how much uh, uh, gas we're getting into the lung. But we never know how that gas is distributing. And also a word of caution when we're using volume targeted modes, such as volume guarantee. Because again, the ventilator is saying, OK, now I'm putting into this baby 4 ml per kilo. OK? That's OK if we have both lungs completely insufflated. What happens if you have an atelectasis of part of that lung? Or if you have pulmonary hypoplasia, such as a congenital diaphragmatic hernia? So how much lung do you really have? If you keep using the same 4 mLs per kilo, what you're actually doing is you're putting those 4 mLs into the lungs, the alveoli that are actually accepting that volume, and the atelectasis is not accepting any volume at that point, and over distending the healthy lung and not distending the um, compromised lung. The same happens if you have a great area of alveolar um, um, closure, such as uh, pneumonia or whatever you are trying to ventilate. So um, hopefully in the future, we will have um, some way of knowing. And there, is some, um, there are some machines that now actually can tell you how the air is distributed within the lung. The Dreger brand has uh, put out um, a device that's called the Pulmovista, in which you actually see how the lung is being insufflated through uh, impedance. And you're, it's very graphical because you're seeing, OK, if you have an atelectasis in one lung, you're seeing over distension over the rest of the lung. And you're actually having a much more precise idea. There's supposed to be a neonatal version of this coming out somewhere in the future. So um, generally, when we're ventilating a pulmonary hypertension, it's not easy. I think that's the worst nightmare than any, that any neonatologist uh, wants to have in a, in a shift. And we know that if we over-distend that 
uh, lung, we will start increasing the pulmonary vascular resistance in a mechanical way. Why? Because the alveolar uh, contribution of the capillaries will start increasing the pressure. If we understand that lung, we will also have some contribution with the atelectasis, mainly coming from the extra alveolar. So at least from a theoretical point of view, the ideal is to be as close to the ideal distending pressure as possible. And sometimes excessive pressure is not a good, um, is not a good strategy in pulmonary hypertension. So this is what we were talking about, that even in normal lung, and even in a supposedly very homogeneous um, disease such as RDS, we have different alveoli in different points of this pressure um, volume curve. So we might be under distending some and over distending some. There is an index that the many ventilators are calculating. I don't know if you use it clinically, the C20C index as an index of over distension. I don't know if, are you using it? Um, the C20C. What it does basically is it calculates the general compliance in that baby, and it calculates the 20%, the upper 20% of the curve. And in theory, when you start reaching this point, the flow pressure curve, the volume pressure curve, starts looking like the neck of a swan, right? It starts flattening out. So the upper compliance will be much lower than the total compliance. And this index will fall below one. And therefore, it might give you a clue of whether you're over distending a patient. And most newer ventilators actually report this. So we play with compliance. That's one of the few things that we've exported to a general medicine, surfactant. Most of the rest we've imported from adult and pediatric intensive care. And this is a very old um, data set in which um, Goldsmith showed something that's quite interesting. Um, and it makes me think a lot and reinforces, at least in my view, the use of volume guarantee particularly after um, surfactant administration. Because we have this correct idea that we are modifying compliance. The issue is that we are modifying compliance, but not in the short term. We're probably modifying compliance after a couple of hours of surfactant administration. What we are actually doing on a very short-term basis is increasing FRC. So it's a very good and efficient recruiting maneuver, the administration of surfactant. And such as high frequency. High frequency is another very efficient recruiting maneuver. So linking with the talk about nitric oxide, uh, it kind of makes sense that a very good recruiting maneuver such as high frequency plays very well together with nitric oxide. And there's lots of work that has shown that nitric oxide and high frequency potentiate and they actually you know, increase the effect when you have a disease where you need pulmonary recruitment. Recently, there was, uh, I don't believe it's published yet, but there was some work done in Chile by a group uh, led by Álvaro González, who was trained with uh, Eduardo Bancalari, 
And they showed that the use of surfactant can also increase significantly the effectiveness of nitric oxide administration, basically because it recruited much more lung before the administration of uh, nitric oxide. And that was a very, very interesting uh, randomized clinical trial that was presented in SPR this year, last year. So um, at least in, in my head, it helps me to actually think of ventilation from two objectives. Are we trying to, do we have a problem in oxygenation? Do we have a problem in ventilation? Or do we have a mixed problem? And in conventional ventilation, we have mean airway pressure and FiO2 means what concentration of oxygen we're administering and at what pressure we're administering this um, gas. The things get complex here with conventional ventilation because you can play around to arrive to the correct mean airway pressure with a lot of parameters. So inspiratory time will affect it, expiratory time, positive inspiratory pressure, peep and flow. They all affect in different ways the mean airway pressure. FiO2 is a simple knob in the ventilator, so it's much more easy. On the ventilation side of it, we have minute volume. And therefore, we have respiratory rate and tidal volume. We sometimes very mechanically associate Let's increase the rate every time we need to increase minute volume to wash out more CO2. But sometimes what's really needed is to improve tidal volume. And therefore, changes a delta pressure and compliance can affect tidal volume. And here is just a very old scheme of how each of these parameters impact the mean airway pressure, increase the differential pressure, increase the inspiratory time, increase the flow. And we were playing with the ventilator before because you can set in the ventilator, at least in the dragger, you can set it to either rise time or flow. But basically it's the same parameter that you're playing with. Rise time will tell you, okay, what angle you're giving to this curve, and if you have a higher, a more pronounced angle, a steeper slope, then you will have more area under the curve and increase the mean airway pressure. I think in neonatology, we're more accustomed to using flow. The only difference with that ventilator is that when you set it with slope instead of flow, it will only allow you to go down with the flow to a point where you actually reach the maximum set pressure. If you set it for flow, you might be able to lower the flow to a point where you won't reach the desired pressure. So that's basically the difference. Inspiratory, uh, inspiratory time, um, expiratory time, and peak. Lots of people had tried to correlate a little bit CO2 and minute volume. There seems to be a correlation. The correlation is not exact. We tend to use the minute volume alarm. At least, I don't know what, how you set that alarm here, but we tend to set it at 400 mLs per kilo. So that should give us an idea when the baby is going very close to hyperventilation. Uh, but it's always a guess. Um, most babies are around 200, but the variability, as you can see here, is huge. In high-frequency ventilation, and I think this is where more development has come with these newer ventilation, with the ventilators, oxygenation gets simplified. Why? Because now you have a knob for FiO2 and another one for mean airway pressure. So you don't have a lot of fuss with 
playing around with mean airway pressure. But ventilation aspect of it has changed significantly. Why? Because now you have a concept that before we didn't have, which is called, okay, so tidal volume in high frequency. And this concept is, as you know, in high frequency, we have attenuation of the oscillation between what we have proximately to what we actually reaches the lung or the, the patient. This is the ventilator and this is the patient. So in the sensor medics, you set something here. What happens here, nobody knows. You can even clamp the tube and the ventilator will keep functioning. In fact, when the RT set the ventilator, they do it with a plug in the inspiratory limb. So the ventilator will not alarm anything if you clamp the ET tube. But this type of ventilator, you have a midpoint measurement. You have a measurement here, which is the flow sensor. So the flow sensor will measure a certain amount of volume that's oscillating there. And they have termed this volume high frequency, tidal volume in high frequency. So therefore, you may be able to differentiate an attenuation of the oscillation such as this versus this because in this midpoint you will have changes. So now we have a parameter that we didn't have before and that's I think one of the main differences. Now we have something that has been correlated in some ways with ventilation. So we have, we know that Tidal volume in high frequency is affected by rate, and we will play around with that. And it's affected by delta pressure or amplitude. But now we can actually measure it, because if we clamp the tube here, we will see it very quickly how the pressure, I mean the VTHF or the, sorry, the TVHF actually drops. And if you put it in the volume guarantee mode, it will alarm because it will say, OK, we're not able to arrive, or I'm not able to arrive to the desired TVHF with the parameters that you're giving me. Something has changed. So if the baby starts accumulating secretions, for example, what will happen? There will be an obstruction. There will be an attenuation of this curve and then you will have a drop of this. And I want to show you tomorrow that what will happen here and we will try to see it, how it interacts with all the parameters, how the TVHF interacts with amplitude, how it interacts with IE ratio with normally we, we don't we won't change and I understand that for the protocol that you're about to start it won't be it would be fixed as in the sensor medics in one to two and it will also um, interact with rate and also understand tomorrow why this type of ventilator has less power and therefore should be used at lower rates because otherwise if you tend to connect a premature baby in this type of ventilator with 15 hertz it won't work. I mean you won't be able to oscillate it efficiently. And then you also have this IE ratio which will affect directly and I want to show you that tomorrow with the ventilator. So um, this is another concept and it's more related to conventional ventilation. I don't know how you guys said here the sensitivity in the flow sensor. Do you play with it or do you tend to keep it as sensitive as possible? 
But I, by I think the RTs are, are watching that as they okay. But by no means you use it a, as a way of weaning or anything like that. No, Increasing the sensitivity or decreasing the sensitivity to wean a patient. No? I don't think so. Okay, good. Because uh, here's the same piglet model. We have maximum sensitivity here. So what happens? Just a small drop in pressure means a little flow detected by the ventilator and therefore the ventilator responds quickly with the delta pressure. If you go and put the lowest sensitivity, what will happen is a synchrony, basically. You will have the piglet trying to lower the pressure, which won't be detected into a higher threshold and therefore you might have a pattern that's very, very close to the asynchronous pattern. So, because this is retarded from the effort of the baby, in this case, the piglet. So, uh, that's why, at least in our unit, although that imposes more work on the nurses, we keep our ventilators usually on the highest sensitivity so always. I've, I've seen that, yes. I've seen that. Yeah. And I think that's dangerous because it, it, it just moves towards a synchrony, which is not desired. So, uh, dead space, we cut ET tubes. Do you do that? Um, we used to cut them to try to lower dead space. I think we're still cutting them but for a different reason and I'm just showing here and this is some measurements we did that the length of a 2.5 ET tube 16 centimeters the dead space which it contributes is 0 0.049 mLs per centimeter so the amount of dead space that you're actually you know gaining or lowering is really minimal the resistance is huge. So what you're really gaining when cutting a tube is lowering the resistance more than gaining dead space. The dead space is not really an important thing. And even when you have a trash care, I, I, I understand you have closed suctioning systems here also, yeah. which is what we've standardized. And do you do routine aspirations or only if the baby needs them? Only as needed. Every four hours, no, okay, yeah. I think that's, that's not recommended anymore because we know that even in a closed uh, system, we are de-recruiting many alveoli every time we suction the baby. And, and that's been shown very, very easily. So I think we've been sophisticating the ventilators. The problem is we, that imposes work on us because we need to sophisticate ourselves now because these <laughs> machines get more and more uh, complex oh and more difficult to use. <laughs> 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 and so um, I think that's, um, that's the message for today. I'm sorry it took a little bit longer than expected. Okay, so thank you.